gay card, the working class card. I'm supposed to be a product of the left. I'm supposed to belong to the left, be a proponent of left wing values. I'm supposed to basically act like I'm a victim, like because I didn't I wasn't born with privilege. I wasn't born with any, you know, great assets as far as connections and all the rest of it are concerned that I must believe that we need more left wing so-called progressive policies in this country. And I don't. I happen to think progressive policies are what's responsible for ensuring that people from backgrounds like mine are the way they are. They are unable to actually get ahead in life. Hey everybody, I'm Brad Palumbo. Welcome back to my channel. Now this is the first in a new series I'm doing called Breaking Brad, where I interview the most controversial and interesting people from across the internet. Today we're talking to Darren Grimes, who might just be the most hated gay man in Britain. In fact, he's so unpopular in some circles that the government even investigated him for his YouTube interviews. We'll dive into that conversation, but first, be sure to like this video, comment, subscribe, and let me know below what you think of this new series and who you want to see me interview. Now let's get to it. Hey Darren, thanks for coming on. Thank you very much for having me. So to start, maybe just tell our audience a little bit about your backstory. How did you become a national broadcaster and political pundit? Really by accident, to be honest. I uh, became interested in politics around about the time of the same-sex marriage debate in this country, which was, oh, I'm testing myself now, 2013. And I was 19 at the time. I'd never been political at all before that. I used to watch Channel 4 News as a kid with my mother. And actually, for the Americans that don't know, Channel 4 News is basically somewhere to the left of Chairman Mao. And, you know, it's like MSNBC or something like that. And I'm, it's a wonder I'm not a massive communist. But apart from that, I never had any real introduction to, to politics whatsoever. But I became interested around the same-sex marriage debate. I followed that through the Houses of Parliament. And uh, I caught the bug from there, really. And I applied in 2014 for a spot on the BBC's Generation 2015 which was for first-time voters. I was in that election of 2015, a first-time voter. And uh, basically, the, the BBC, the national broadcaster in Britain, is responsible for creating the beast that it now views as Darren Grimes. So, well done them. <laughs> that's hilarious. And that's how you got involved with Brexit, right? I know you were a big Leave campaigner. Tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. So originally, I was a member of the Liberal Democrats. Now, the Liberal Democrats in this country were at that time when I first became interested in politics in coalition government with the Conservatives and I thought I must be the complete opposite of my mother's politics. Now my mother, I just said uh, Channel 4 News is somewhere to the left of Chairman Mao, my mother is somewhere to the right of Attila the Hun and I thought <laughs> I, must be, I must be the opposite of my mother's politics so I thought I must be a liberal and I use that in a, a small L sense but that must mean that I'm in the big L party, the Liberal Party. Now, the Liberal Party, actually, as it transpired, has long ceased to be anything that you would, you and I would view as, as liberal, right? You and I would view as liberalism. So I quickly realised that actually, you know, just because I'm not, I don't share my mother's politics, which actually I think I do, to be honest with you, but, I, you know, teenage angst and all that. And I, I thought, right, well, where do I sit now? And I started to think about it a bit more. And David Cameron, then Prime Minister, had just won a majority on a mandate of saying, look, if, if I win an outright majority, I will guarantee that we have an in-out referendum on Britain's status within the European Union. And I started to think about that, as many people did, right? This was a relationship that we'd had with the EU for 40 odd years. Obviously, I wasn't on this planet at that time. And I think most of the nation hadn't really considered in any great depth our relationship with the EU. And I started to think about it and I, I thought, how can I, as a liberal, argue that we need to devolve power as close to the individual as possible, whilst also arguing that we need to give more and more away to what I view as a remote and unaccountable institution in Brussels and Strasbourg. It did not make sense. I couldn't square that circle in my head. 
So, yeah, that's why I started a campaign for Brexit. I set up a, a youth campaign and, and the rest is history. Yeah, so I mean, I never obviously really had much of a dog in the fight, but I always was sympathetic to the Brexit argument on the grounds of sovereignty. I mean, some people were opposed to Brexit because they opposed the actual outcomes of, of the European Union membership in terms of immigration or trade. I tend to be pretty liberal on those issues, favor more open immigration and more open trade. But I ultimately think that those policies should be dictated by your nation, not by another nation, especially because the EU is not a very, I don't have a ton of understanding of it, but from what I understand, it's not exactly a democratic institution, right? You don't have a whole lot of say over what the EU is doing in your name, do you? Absolutely not. And actually, I think the current scandal, the corruption scandal that's wreaking havoc within the European Parliament itself right now, where there are allegations, very serious allegations being made about cash for access, essentially, for uh, some regimes around the world potentially handing over suitcases, actual suitcases of cash, the kind of stuff that we see in sort of mafia films, uh, suitcases of cash over to get votes, essentially. So it's very, very divisive right now. And I think that's because a lot of people say, well, I have absolutely no idea, ultimately, who it is that represents me in the European Parliament. You know, European nation states, the remaining 27, but it was 28 when we were a member, are of the view that actually we have absolutely no account. They have no accountability and we have no say. You elect people, but it seems to be sort of shadow boxing, right? It's not, you're not really getting anything out of it. You're not really, it's not meaningful in any way. And once you start having nation states think about these issues, as we did in this country, as I've just described, I think you do conclude that actually it's better that, and I, I am a conservative, I believe in the nation state, but to actually think about those things and you start thinking about the, the powers that your nation state has handed over to this faceless bureaucracy, essentially. And I fear, well, I don't fear, actually. I, you know, the EU can do whatever they like now that we're out, as far as I'm concerned. But I do wonder if actually this is going to be, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back, essentially, because people are starting to think about this issue in places other than Britain. And some will conclude, naturally, maybe hungry, that the EU just simply doesn't work for them. So with the entire kind of Brexit movement and your involvement is that in that, is that when the Darren Grimes hate club formed? Because I've <laughs> got to say, you're like one of the most hated people from what it seems to me from like, the UK internet, especially on the left and in progressive circles. I think only Pierce Morgan might have you beat uh, from from where I sit, just, you know, as an onlooker. What is it about you that pisses people off so much and has earned you this kind of obsessive following of people who can't stand you? I genuinely think that it comes down to, uh, I went back to the same-sex marriage debate, right, when I first became interested in politics. If you consider... Uh, the reason for that is because, as you know, I'm gay and I was interested in that legislation coming through Parliament. I happen to agree with it. Now, I, by the way, I do disagree with churches being forced to do it, which is why I agreed with David Cameron saying, you know, we must have religious freedom to say no, essentially. Mm -hmm. So I supported it on that on that basis. And... If you consider the gay card, right, you consider the working class card, I was brought up in what you might deem to be sort of, I guess, the Rust Belt, There's, you know, something like that. It, it's ex-industry uh, area, we're called County Durham, and uh, which is in the northeast of England. And if you consider the gay card, the working class card, uh, the... The Northeast in general is, is primarily thought of as being safe ground for the left. There are a whole host of issues in which I book the trend, in which I, or what was the trend until Boris Johnson won a massive majority in areas like this in 2019. But all of those cards, the gay cards, the working class card, I'm supposed to be a product of the left. I'm supposed to belong to the left, be a proponent of left-wing values. I'm supposed to basically act like I'm a victim. Like, because I, didn't, I wasn't born with 
privilege. I wasn't born with any, you know, great assets as far as uh, connections and all the rest of it are concerned. That I must believe that we need more left-wing so-called progressive policies in this country. And I don't. I happen to think progressive policies are what's responsible for ensuring that people from backgrounds like mine are the way they are. They are unable to actually get ahead in life. It's directly linked to those policies. So I think that's what pisses them off the most, is that I, and I hope I'm allowed to swear on here, but is that I don't actually conform to all of the stereotypes that they would expect someone of, of my background and, and sexual orientation to actually, you know, conform to. How has the LGBT media and community treated you? I know I've had not the best reception here in the U.S. from, from that crowd. In fact, I was kicked off a gay men's soccer team because they said that my transphobic views, which I'm not transphobic, I just don't think child children should medically transition, um, mm -hmm. which is not actually a radical position except in certain bubbles, um, because not only were there no transgender members of the team, they said my views endangered the safety of hypothetical future members of the team. So my views that I didn't talk about at, at soccer, obviously, we were playing soccer, um, endangered the safety of imaginary people. And I was excommunicated for that. And I've had all sorts of hit pieces in the, you know, the LGBT media about me and sorts of stuff. But I imagine you've even had it probably a bit worse. What's it been like for you within that community? So there's a outfit. Have you heard of Pink News? Yes. Oh, yes. they've done some very unflattering. They love to get the most unflattering screen grabs <laughs> of me to use in their articles. <laughs> Yeah, well, me too. At one point, I felt like I had my sort of weekly column that was being <laughs> ghostwritten for me in, in Pink News. But it's, you know, those sort of legacy gay press who are a bit like St. George in retirement. You know, St. George, famous for killing the dragon, patron saint of uh, England. St. George in retirement. That's how I think of the legacy gay press. You know, they've slayed the dragon. The dragon being the pursuit of equality. We've achieved equality as gay men and women, and now they're looking for the next frontier. And that happens to be killing off sheep and all the rest of it. So St. George has gone a bit mad. That's how I view the legacy gay press in Britain, but certainly in the United States as well. And I've had some really, really quite awful things said about me by them. You know, that I'm not a, I'm not a real gay, I'm not... I'm not an ally, uh, and frankly, you know, I, I couldn't care less, to be quite honest with you, because if you are someone that genuinely believes, that, as you've just pointed out, that the young people should basically be uh, told that, you know, you might not be in the right body when young people already have enough going on up here without thinking about issues like that, and all sorts of issues, drag queens in schools, I just, I just don't like that. I, I want to be a, as far away from that as I possibly can be. If that makes me some kind of conservative reactionary, then so be it. I don't think it does as it, ma as it happens. But the, the, all those sorts of attack lines, the, the only uh, other person that I can think of at one point that was in Pink News more than I am um, is J.K. Rowling. And I mean, they, the legacy gay press attack Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter books, of course, for opening a women's refuge. And guess why? Because actually she says, well, hang on a minute, men can't come into a women's refuge. Kel surprise. And people act shocked by this. And people look for new victims and look for new attack lines. And that's why I really, really could not, frankly, care less what the legacy gay press has to say about me because they've totally lost their way and their moral compass. Yeah, and I, I want to get your thoughts on this as somebody who campaigned for same-sex marriage. I'm uh, I'm a little bit younger, a few years younger than you, but so I'm I'm friendly with some of the some older gays who really fought that fight here in the U.S. Uh, and they'll tell me that they feel like the the you talked about how they've lost the plot because they've achieved their main goal, but they need to keep fundraising, they need to keep justifying their own existence, these LGBT activists, this LGBT media, so they go for more and more outlandish things now that they've achieved their actual function of gay marriage and general tolerance for gay people, I think in the UK and in the US. 
Well, now they'll go and they're going to these new extremes of like, I really, I'm, I'm of the opinion that I don't care what an adult wants to do with their life. If they want to be trans, if they want to do medical stuff, if they're over the age of 18, do whatever you like. But this idea that we have to pretend that biology doesn't make a difference in sports, right, for example, is nuts. This idea that children who haven't even gone through puberty can consent to life-altering sex change procedures, uh, well, eventually, right, uh, after they go through puberty blockers and hormones and everything, before the age of consent, to me is not, is just, it's wild. But all these things, I was asked recently, and I, and I want to know what your thoughts about this uh, in the UK are, but in the US, there's been a little bit of backsliding. I actually think there's a little less tolerance of gay people and gay marriage than there was mm. one or two years ago. And I think the reason for that is that it's been tied to this LGBTQIA plus community and agenda that is now moving on to these very controversial terrains and taking down with it some of the progress that we've made. I sort of think of it a lot like the Black Lives Matter movement. On the face of it, that's an incredibly laudable sounding slogan, right? Black Lives Matter. And people say, well, yes, of course. Now, that movement, as you well know, certainly in the United States, but over here as well, and actually, I don't know why it was in this country, to be honest, because the death of George Floyd happened in the United States of America, not in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, but we are where we are. <laughs> and the, the movement quickly morphed into something else, right? It quickly became obvious that it was a front for Marxist ideas, for abolishing the nuclear family and all the rest of it. It's the same with the outfits like Extinction Rebellion, right? You, you look, you underneath, you scratch beneath the surface, not very far. It's a very thin veneer, and you start to see these kinds of Marxist ideas again. And I see the same with the the issue around trans. It it has morphed into. Back when I was talking about issues like same sex marriage, this wasn't a long time ago. You know, this was this was a decade ago. The issue around for, for trans people would have been, we want to be left alone in society, right? We want to be able to get our gender recognition certificate, which is the way in which in this country you go through a process of living in, uh, uh, in the, your preferred you know, sex or gender uh, for two years. And at the end of it, if a doctor signs you off and all the rest of it, you get your gender recognition certificate. That, to me actually verifying that someone has gender dysphoria, which is, by the way, is a pretty serious medical condition, right? It is you rejecting who you are, you rejecting your body, fundamental elements of, of your person. It's incredibly serious. And we sort of, with candor and, and, and gay abandon, gay in the uh, all use the traditional sense of the word. And I, I look at those sort of things and I, I feel sorry for, for trans people now. Because the ones that, that I speak to and have spoken to at my time uh, in broadcast, they say to me, they don't speak for us, right? They say to me, we just want to be left alone. And that's a lot how I feel with the legacy gay press, like the likes of Pink News, right? I've got my rights, thank you. And I appreciate that. And I'm grateful for the gay people that came before me. And I'm sure you are too, right? Mm -hmm. That came before us, who have led the way and ensured that we do have access to, to what I view as, as fundamental rights. To love, you know, it's a pretty simple thing. And for trans people, a fundamental right to safety, a fundamental right to equality in law, fine. That's fine by me. But now that movement has, has been turned on its head and actually we're saying we need to strip away the role of the parent and actually, we need what I view as, as quite radical activism to be able to dictate what your child does and doesn't need. Mm -hmm. And again, like B Black Lives Matter, like the Green Movement, I think the trans movement has now been captured and is completely changing from what it actually used to be, which was very laudable and sensible for trans people to be able to walk about in day to day life and be left alone, not fearing that they're going to get their heads kicked in, essentially, and things like that. That I support. I do not support 
this current activism and you know you've got the likes of president biden inviting the what i would describe as radical trans activists into the white house that's that's yeah. how far down the the rabbit hole we've gone and it's the same in this country you know sir keir starmer who's the leader of the labor party is the main opposition party in britain he couldn't bring himself to describe what a woman is right that's that's how far down this thing we've gone and pandering to these people and it it just it beggars belief it really really does and i i a lot of people say, I don't know why you get so het up about this sort of thing. And I say, it's because I recognise the consequences of it. You know, when I was at school, I was a very, very different beast to what I am today. I was very, very shy. I was quite badly bullied at school around being gay. And to be honest, at one point, I imagine I hated my body, right? And I, I put myself in, in that position back then. And I think of adolescents like that who are crying out for some kind of quick fix right you want to feel better about yourself you don't want to feel this inward rejection that you've you've been made to feel essentially and i worry that we're going to have an entire generation and this is pointed out in stats the gender recognition and gender identity services in the nhs our national health service show a massive increase from when I was at school to kids today. You know, you're talking hundreds of percent. It's not minor. Where people are saying, I, I'm experiencing gender dysphoria. And it's because they view this as, as a way, and it's primarily young women, by the way, and there are studies which suggest that it's autistic women who have this deep-rooted loathing of their body, as many teenagers do, and they think that actually the fix is through gender, through gender identity. And, and at some p point even, and we had a famous court case in this country in the case of Kira Bell. And Kira Bell had transitioned through the uh, gender identity clinic. The, we only have one for children in this country. And it was called the Tavistock, the NHS Tavistock and Portman Trust. And she went through that. And she had a, a, a two, maybe three appointments with them before they said, yep, yeah, happy to go we'll put you on puberty blockers generally irreversible they may be but let's do it we'll go full speed ahead and now she feels that actually she should have had more in the way of uh, medical professionals saying well actually we're not sure that this is the right path a medical pathway is the right one maybe actually we should pursue more therapeutic options and that's what I would have hoped had young Darren Grimes, I never experienced uh, any uh, kind of, of gender dysphoria, but had I been uh, assuming that that was my, you know, get out of jail free card, that actually that would be what makes me feel better in life, that we would have medical professionals who step in and say, oh, I'm not sure, maybe we should uh, do some talking therapies first. But now, Bradley, guess what? You're told that to pursue therapeutic options is conversion therapy, right? Yeah. You are converting that child. And that breaks my heart because these kids tend to need a hug and a friendly home, right? Not to be, you know, chopped to bits, mutilated, in my opinion. I realise that's very graphic language. But yeah, I, I, I think the whole thing has totally lost its way. And that was a very long-winded way to answer your question. So I do apologize. <laughs> no, no worries. I want to shift gears slightly and talk about the scandal that got you literally investigated by the police uh, for your journalism. Well, there have been your... a couple of those. But yeah. Sure. But the, the, <laughs> um, the one where you interviewed this historian on your mm -hmm. YouTube channel, which we'll link to and people can check out. Um, and he made what I think can fairly be described as an offensive comment about slavery. Uh, and you later said, I don't agree with this and I should have caught this in the moment. Uh, and, you know, most people, that's the life of a broadcaster, right? Like when you're interviewing hundreds of people, when you're covering all this content, somebody might say something on your show that's offensive. In the U.S., it's just insane to us as a concept that that would become a police matter but you were actually investigated by the metropolitan police for something a guest said on your youtube interview 
What? Yeah. Yes, it was uh, under Section 24 of the Public Order Act. Now, the Public Order Act of 1984 is a piece of legislation passed by Margaret Thatcher. Now, it was passed at a time when we were having riots on the streets, right, where there was a a real breakdown in uh, public order. So it was a necessary piece of legislation to bring about peace and stability in this country. But now it's being used to actually say, well... You, as a YouTuber, as a content creator, are responsible for the broadcast that you put out. So if you broadcast racist views, then you are complicit. And by the way, I, 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 I would struggle. I think, David Starkey, you may find what he said to be offensive and it may not sit right with you. But I think he has an absolute right to say it, by the way. And uh, I think we, we ought to hear these views, as I think Kanye West should be able to air his views. Di- sunlight is the best disinfectant, yeah, right? I agree with we, that. When, when we're able to actually hear these views, we're able to challenge them and they're not allowed to fester in the darker parts of the internet. So putting that to one side, I was told that uh, I got this email, so we, you know, they, they, it wasn't through any formal channels, Uh, And it said, you know, we want to bring you in for an interview and uh, potentially arrest you under the Public Order Act for broadcasting this interview. And I immediately got on to the Free Speech Union, which was in its infancy, really, but very necessary in this country. There are all kinds of really, really wacky stuff when it comes to speech and debate in this country, cancel culture running absolutely rampant. And the Free Speech Union helped me out. They got me a solicitor and we fought it. And uh, actually, you know, almost in concert with Dr. David Starkey because he had exactly the same solicitor. Now, Dr. David Starkey, I don't think, uh, looks at me favourably, but you may think that's fair, you may think it's not fair. Ultimately, I wasn't the one that said it. And I think that's your fundamental point, isn't it? That I wasn't the one that said it. Even if you do think it's offensive speech or, or unlawful speech, which which I don't happen to Yeah, I mean, I believe. also don't think he should be prosecuted for it. Because no, it's, exactly. In the US, right, we have the First Amendment, and that includes the right, it literally included the right of literal Nazis to stroll down the street in a Jewish neighborhood and spew their hate because we believe in this country that even hate speech is free speech, right? Because who gets to decide what's hateful? You, when we start locking people up for their ideas, for the things they've said, or prosecuting them, or investigating them, that has a chilling effect. I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. would have been imprisoned, right? Every radical activist who's pushed progress in this society, I think, I assume this is also true in the UK, was at one point considered a heretic, right? At one point was considered offensive, extreme. And some things genuinely are offensive and extreme, but we have to allow them in order to have free speech. So... I look at the UK sometimes and I'm like, because we're so similar, because we share a culture, we share a common law, but we have a First Amendment and you guys don't. And so when I see this kind of insanity, like the police investigating you over an interview, over words, um, it reminds me like that's what the US would be like without our First Amendment. We would really start to slip. And we don't have a codified constitution in this country, right? We we just sort of have unwritten... Uh, going all the way back to Magna Carta, right, which was a very long time ago. But, and and those, that has its benefits, right? I'm not, I don't wish to trash the way entirely that we do things in this country. But when you look at things like the government, a conservative government's uh, online safety bill, now that bill, it contains a clause on legal but harmful speech. Now, it goes back to the point that you've just eloquently made there, which is, if you, who is the ultimate arbiter of what is and isn't harmful speech, right? I might be tweeting about my views on self-identification, right? The right for me as a biological man to wake up tomorrow and say, well, actually, my name's Doreen, not Darren, and you have to give me access to single-sex spaces. I happen to believe that's wrong. Is that harmful speech? There are so many question marks around this particular piece of legislation. And I think it all goes back 
to that fundamental point that you've just made, that we do not have in this country provisions to protect freedom of expression. And that all comes down to the fact that it was settled, right? They, we just assumed that we all were, always would have the right to free speech, to freedom of association, to all of these things in this country. And I'm afraid I don't believe that that's true at the moment. There wouldn't be a need for an outfit, a unionised outfit, like the Free Speech Union. As it happens, unionised labour and all the rest of it, I happen to disagree with many unions. So they tend to be on the hard left, certainly in this country. Uh, communist ideals and, and the, all those sort of things, which I happen to believe run contrary to the interests of the working class. So all of these things come down to, and, and I think hit home, how much of a crisis free speech is in this country. Not like you have it in America. People think it's bad in America, but I tell you what, it's, it's a whole other beast in this country where you can be threatened with arrest. And imagine if I didn't have a platform. I would have been arrested, right? That's the, that's the, the be-all and end-all of it. I was actually able to put pressure on them. I mean, it even got to the point where the Home Secretary of the United Kingdom made a tweet not explicitly mention, mentioning me, but making reference to this kind of case, which is, it was absolutely extraordinary. But that's where we are in the UK. Yeah, and that's, to me, a big red flag for people in the US. Don't let them undermine our free speech protections, or this is no. where we will end up. I want to ask you briefly about something I don't really care about, but a lot of people seem to care about, and that's the, the royal family, and in particular, Meghan Markle. So, on most Americans, the liberal media here likes her, and props her up, and is like, yes, queen, a what a woke icon, but I think most people generally don't view her favorably here. But people absolutely despise her in the UK. Can you give us a brief rundown of why it is that so many people in the UK resent Meghan Markle? I mean, you've got to ask yourself, I don't know if any of your viewers will have watched the uh, Netflix so-called documentary, which is more like a Kardashian spin-off reality television. Uh, but the reason they're so unpopular in this country is because... In, they basically sought to attack our late and great monarch, Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II, and indeed our current one, King Charles III, in seeking to actually claim that they, be, they, were un, they were treated unfairly in this country because, well, frankly, because the truth is inconvenient, right? The, the, they had their facts. I don't know if you watched the Oprah interview, but they had, they had their facts, their truth, I think is the expression. And... Um, they basically sought to accuse our nation of being a uniquely racist one, when actually we have absolutely, unlike America, and it goes back to the point I made on Black Lives Matter, I think unlike certain parts of America, we have absolutely fantastic race relations in this country. The, probably, I would argue, the most successful race relations that the world has ever known. We have an Asian prime minister right now in this country. We've had a black chancellor of the exchequer, two minutes ago. The United States had President Obama. You know, they, you go back to these points. When they wax lyrical about concepts like white privilege during a generation-defining cost-of-living crisis, where people in this country, for Americans that don't understand this, you have your shale gas, your beautiful access to shale gas. We ban shale gas in this country. We are greener than green. We look like Kermit the Sodding Frog, right? We talk about, okay, we have this cost of living crisis, and yet they come, they, they have this Netflix series in which they attack our vote for Brexit, they seek comfort in Spotify and Netflix over Queen and Country in Britain, in California of all places. Why the hell should they expect the British people to respect them? If you look at the polling, Will and Kate have a, a net rating, who, of course, William will be king one day. They have net ratings of plus 62 and plus 57. I believe that's according to YouGov. And Harry and Meghan are on 20, minus 26 and minus 39, respectively. That actually is only beaten by the Duke of York, Prince Andrew, who was involved in the whole scandal, the whole affair around, well, there was a big BBC Newsnight document, uh, not documentary, interview even, in this country with the Duke of York, where he thought he was going to set out 
why in his case the whole allegations around him and uh, being linked to a, what was called a, a, a you know paedophile affair essentially and he did this interview and that it was a very bad interview in which he made statements like I don't sweat, you know, and things like this. I, I'm, I had lunch, dinner, I think it was, in a Pizza Express, which a Pizza Express in this country, I guess, is a bit like having lunch at a, a Wendy's in America. And it was bizarre, frankly. And they're only, as, as, they're only beaten in their unpopularity in Britain by him, by Prince Andrew. And it's because this is a fundamental attack on Britain, right? This is an attack on who we are as a nation. Our national story has long been one based around kings and queens, right? And what we're about. We reject it. We reject them. We reject the kind of divisive race baiting and radical left smears, frankly, that are evident throughout this series, throughout the six episodes in this Netflix series, that they choose to platform in their reality television. We reject the idea, the notion that we're some kind of intolerant Brexit backing backwater or that Brexit is a uniquely evil thing. And I, I guess I would sum it up, my anger today is based around their attacks on the on the Commonwealth. So Commonwealth, for those that don't know, is a voluntary organisation that seeks to advance democracy, trade and aid in some cases of former British Empire states, right? So former now sovereign, for the most part, right? You, they might still have the Queen as the head of state, but many don't now. And... Uh, they are free to come and go as they wish. Her Majesty the Queen was the head of the Commonwealth, now King Charles III is the head of the Commonwealth. As I say, a voluntary organisation. And this organisation has been responsible for much good in the world. You know, that, as I say, that pursuit of democracy, that pursuit of trade being a fundamentally good thing between nations that want to cooperate with each other. And yet, I would argue it's it's... The proudest, it probably was the proudest achievement of Her Majesty the Queen's reign, right, throughout her 70 odd years on the throne. A long time. And she was immensely proud of that. So for her grandson, for Prince Harry, to seek to call it, and I believe it, or, or allow it to be called, or referred to as Empire 2.0. Now, Bradley, it's nothing like the empire, right? The empire was literally Britain going in and saying, at it, it, large parts of the world, the sun never set on the British empire. In large parts of the world, the British way of doing things is the better way of doing things. And I think there are actual, I think there are good points, merits to, to what Britain did around the world, frankly. But the idea that the Commonwealth is remotely comparable to the empire as it was it's fanciful it is a bizarre comparison so there are arguments like that where people view it as a trashing of her majesty the queen's legacy and let's not forget she, she only died three months ago and that was a real I, I guess americans won't really understand what that was like but it was like losing our nation's grandmother right it was like losing someone that had just always been there, the one constant in all of our lives. I think of it described by my grandfather, who was a miner. Uh, he used to work down the pit. And despite the fact that those industries no longer exist, exist in Britain anymore, the one constant in the lives of someone like him, which has changed beyond all recognition, the one constant was Her Majesty the Queen. A largely working class family that had m m sort of uh, memorabilia of Her Majesty the Queen on shelving in their household, in my grandfather's household. And that, a working class family celebrating those that live in a palace, right? It, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't make sense, but it does. She was the one constant and the one source of comfort for a nation in times of, of need and comfort. And we all... One line that she said resonated with us, that she actually said, actually, in the wake of the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks, where she said, grief is the price we pay for love. And we felt that as a nation, very much so, a, a national outpouring of grief. 
it was quite beautiful in a way. I was in London at the time and it brought us all together. And I fear, I, I feel that what the, the British people view Harry and Meghan doing is an attempt to divide the British people, to actually separate us around along lines of class, along lines of race, along lines of gender identity or sexuality. And that's the kind of radical leftism that this country has always re rejected. And I think that they've become the vanguard of it, right? They've become, as you say, in California, uh, champions of the radical left. They even came out and backed President Biden, for God's sake. It, it was a bizarre thing to do and unprecedented for a member of the royal family. So, yeah, that in a nutshell is why I think so many people have felt genuine hurt over a man that served in our armed forces that they loved a lot, cheeky chappy Prince Harry. They view it as a sense of hurt and rejection by him for a multi-million pound contract in California. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, and I particularly didn't like the way that Meghan Markle has cast vague aspersions of racism against the royal family with yeah. no naming names, no, no evidence, making it impossible to defend yourself from those kinds of accusations. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about soccer, or I guess you'd call it football, uh, because another thing where you got yourself into the uh, shit list of the internet was when you tweeted <laughs> after the Euro final. So for folks that don't know, the Euros are... Uh, every four years, there's this huge football or soccer tournament in, in which the countries of Europe compete. And it was, and I'm a huge soccer fan, so you know I'm, I'm following this just like you are. Uh, and I watched, and I was rooting for England uh, because Mason Mount is bae. Um, <laughs> but anyway, they lost in the final match in a penalty shootout in overtime against Italy. And a few of England's players missed penalty shots. And unfortunately, some of them were subjected to racial abuse, which is terrible. But you just tweeted, one of them was Marcus Rashford, a striker, uh, who has been very involved in political activism. And you basically just tweeted something to the effect of, Rashford, may maybe practice your penalties and do less politics, which doesn't seem that controversial a sentiment or statement, but you were absolutely pillory for this online <laughs> Why? i mean marcus I, I i sort of i i will hold my hands up and say that i i probably regret making that remark after being quite upset and uh, probably after one or two pints now i uh, on the whole do believe that actually <laughs> marcus rashford for a, a lot of it became uh, and he didn't sing the national anthem, I noticed, during, which is quite offensive to, to people of my political disposition, where uh, it's almost a, I'm, you know, I'm too good for this. I'm a political campaigner. I have achieved free school meals for children. They would starve without me. All hail St. Marcus. It became sort of almost messiah-like. And it, I find it odd, actually. But, you know, he's free He's free to do whatever he wants in his spare time. And if Manchester United think that he's still committing enough time, or indeed England, the national team, are still uh, of the view that he's committing enough time to his club interests, fine, you do you. As long as you're not playing for Newcastle United. So I, I did tweet that. And I think it was, I think it was because... It was probably because of the sensitivity around the abuse that they had received online, which, by the way, primarily came from outside of this country, right? Twitter released stats which showed that actually it was foreign tweeters mm -hmm. who were tweeting this. Now, and nothing it, it, about your tweet was referencing race in any way. Absolutely not. But that's that's what it was turned around as being. And let, in in that moment, you know, I would have been someone that had been outspoken about the BLM movement for the reasons I've mentioned earlier in this recording. And uh, I would be viewed as being on the reactionary right when it comes to Black Lives Matter. So I think that I was pigeonholed as being, oh, well, he must be a racist. He must be saying this because Marcus Rashford is black. And actually, Bradley, I would argue that we're denying black people or Asian people even, or you name it, whatever the colour of your skin, we're denying people of their agency when we say we must be offended on that person's behalf, right? We must, we must find accusations of racism to level against people for any criticism that they make against black players, Asian players, whatever it may be. 
And actually, it was nothing to do with the colour of Marcus Rashford's skin. And I happen to believe, actually, most footy players, and I don't know if you agree with this, but most footy players uh, and fans couldn't give a hoot what the colour of the skin of the people on the pitch is, as long as they're playing a damn good game and they're committed to playing a damn good game, working hard for the club, right? The club's interest to advance up the Premier League, to advance up the Championship, to advance up the Euros, whatever it may be. And they don't care less. They don't care at all, even, about the colour of someone's skin. But everything now is viewed through, through the race of lens, uh, the lens of race, even. Whether that be Meghan Markle, whether that be Marcus Rashford missing a penalty, so many things are viewed exclusively through that lens. I mean, I'm a racist, apparently, for criticising Meghan Markle as well. You know, a lot of people, certainly in the United States of America, when she was introduced to the royal family, said, I had no idea that Meghan Markle, you know, had a black mother, for example. Right? They thought she was a white woman. So the idea that any criticism of Meghan Markle was just inherently racist is for the birds. So, yeah, I think it's a race obsession. I think it's viewing everything through this identitarian lens that has completely driven supposedly rational people totally mad. I will say I find the coverage of the Premier League and of football more broadly completely dearth of even the slightest bit of center-right sane voices. Yeah. Every pundit, every commenter, and then the people like Piers Morgan who do provide a, a, a different view are doing so from without, from the outside, from like a different perspective, not the mainstream sports media. But like on any of these platforms, you will never hear anything but the most obsequious deference to all liberal values. No one would have dared to say, why are they all kneeling for the national anthem every time? What is this accomplishing? Uh, Edison Cavani, and not to go down, a, uh, was absolutely unfairly scapegoated in the name of racism. He said the word negrito, which in negro is an offensive word in English, but is just the word for the color black in many Romance languages like Spanish and Italian, I believe. And so mm. he was using... And then they, they banned him for several matches for a racist term. And everyone's just sitting around nodding like this isn't insane, even though none of his teammates were offended. Uh, so why is it that football has become in the UK, but also throughout the world where it's covered, the Premier League and everything, such a bastion of deference to liberal and center left and progressive voices? Why is it so dearth of any counterbalancing semblance of a force? I think it's because, actually, the, the, in this country, football probably does have a, a past of, of you know, cha racist chants, homophobic chants, uh, misogynistic chants. You name it, right? Football had a history of, of hooliganism, of, of people shouting things that, you know, are, are offensive, that aren't yeah. nice at all. So in order to shake off that past, they've gone so far the other way where if anyone dares disagree with what is viewed as, as the, uh, as, you know, the zeitgeist of the moment or viewed as what's in right now, taking the knee in right now, England was still doing it during the World Cup, right? George Floyd died in the United States of America and that act of taking the knee was heavily linked with him. And that you have British people just saying... But I'm not, I, no one in this country is racist. We have so many black players who are fantastic playing, starting for England. I don't understand where they, why they feel the need to do this. And so you've got the, those that are paying for their season tickets, those that are paying to watch on Sky Sports, which by the way is owned by Comcast, which probably tells you everything you need to know. But the... It's, we're being force-fed a diet of this is what you should think, this is what's in right now, right? This is when actually I just want the sport, right? I want my sport to be divorced from politics. Is that really too much to ask? Well, I was struck by this when I was I, I forget what broadcast, but there was some e event or match where uh, Premier League players or England, I forget who, uh, they were kneeling for the anthem and the crowd booed them, and all three of the pundits talking wow said wow, it's such a shame that the crowd is racist and supports racism and opposes protesting. Like, no, they're not booing because they support racism. They're booing meaningless virtue signaling. Yeah, yeah. 
And it's exactly. like no one on this panel, it, it, maybe they do think it and they're just too scared to speak it, but either it's a total echo chamber or they're so scared of getting canceled and fired that they won't say the quiet part out loud that everyone is thinking. It's a very precarious line of work, sports commentating. And if you do say the wrong thing, that's it, you're out. You know, it is a, a very, very lucrative industry to be in. You're paid incredible salaries. And I think a lot of people are absolutely terrified of losing that. So it's better to conform to, you know, the status quo than it is to dare get out of line. I mean, there were a few footballers, as you say, that that refused to either refused outright to take the knee or spoke out against it and said it was meaningless. And some black players, by the way, that said, actually, I think this is, it, it's not neither here nor there. Why are we doing this? But I, I think I, what got me about that was the, the classist element of it. it. You know, football, it gets a lot of working class people out into stadiums. You know, I, I don't live too far away from St. James's Park, right? It's 52,000 people. And there are 52,000 people who, most of them, a lot of them, don't have a lot in life, Bradley, right? They, they, they have their football and they, they have their jobs, they have their family. And football is almost like a religion to them, right? It used to be that we ha you would have had church alongside your family, but actually, no, you've, you've got football now. St. James's Park is, is called the cathedral <laughs> in, our, in our city in Newcastle. And all of that, to be told by, by your religion that, you know, you're, you, sh you ought to be an outcast, you ought to be condemned for, for sins you haven't committed, i.e. racism... A lot of people took that really per and continue to take that really personally and say, well, I'm not racist, so please stop rubbing my nose into your wackery and mockery that suggests that I am, you know, sod off, frankly. Um, and I shared those sentiments. And for saying that, you're accused of racism and all the rest of it. So I think football is a unique case. It's, you know, it is our national sport. And it, it is increasingly an area where, you know, you say the wrong thing, it's on the highway you go. All right. Well, to round us out, I want to know your most controversial food opinion. So I, have you ever had haggis before? No, but isn't it something gross? Yes. Well, it's like pig intestines and things like that. Ugh. And I love haggis. So haggis on Burns Night, which is a Scottish tradition, uh, I'm not Scottish, but you, I like the tradition, where you have a, a dram of whiskey and, uh, and your, your haggis and tatties, which is mashed potato. Uh, and it's the most delicious thing, I think, in the world. But a lot of people find that a very controversial view. And I actually think haggis was banned from being imported by the United States authorities <laughs> until relatively recently. So yeah. there we are. There you go. All right. Well, Darren, thanks so much for joining us, everybody. If you want to find out more about him and check out his channel, the links to all of that will be in the description. Uh, so thanks so much and uh, go Chelsea. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. God bless. All right, guys, that's it for today. Be sure to like this video, comment, subscribe, yada, yada, yada. Let me know below what you think of the new series and who you want to see interviewed from the most controversial and interesting people on the internet.